In order to ring in springtime, Carol and I took a trip into Harvard Square to meet members of our mineral club at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. We figured we could also see some sights, enjoy some food, check out the street entertainment, and enjoy the April warming. It was the day before Patriots Day and also the marathon, so we expected to see plenty of activity and people. Carol and I take a lot of trips to Cambridge and Boston. There is so much to do. We enjoy various activities, which we will be describing in future programs. Boston is very close to Littleton and easily accessible. You can drive, take the train, use the T, or even take an Uber. We started our day by driving to the Alewife T station in Cambridge to take the Red Line subway to Harvard. On the weekend, parking at Alewife is $3, which is a bargain. We went to the train boarding area for our short trip to Harvard Square. From Alewife to Harvard is three stops. It takes about 15 minutes. We got off the T at Harvard and headed to street level. Carol got ahead of me, and when I caught up, she was talking to a man leading walking tours through Harvard Square. Interestingly, the man was quite familiar with Littleton and was describing his search for relics from John Eliot's day. He showed us some pictures of Littleton that we both recognized. Small world. We walked through Harvard Yard, heading towards the Museum of Natural History. We were meeting up with members of the Neshoba Valley Mineralogical Society to check out the museum's collection of rocks, minerals, fossils, and other curiosities. The Harvard Museum of Natural History is a world-class research institute that has extensive collections of rocks and minerals, fossils, glass flowers, animals, insects, and bird specimens. One admission provides access to museums in herbaria, comparative zoology, minerals and geology, archaeology and ethnology. There's also vintage scientific equipment and more. From the tea station, the museum is less than one quarter mile. We walk across Harvard Yard and snap a picture of John Harvard the founder of Harvard College. We then proceed outside the Harvard Yard gate and are facing the Science Center. We walk to the right of the Science Center onto Oxford Street. We walk by the Harvard Memorial Hall. I always admire the slate roof of this building when we walk by. We enjoy the signs of spring with blooming forsythia and magnolia. In no time, we were in front of the Museum of Natural History. We entered the museum and learned that Sunday admission between 9 and 11 a.m. for Massachusetts residents is free. And a special this month was free admission all day for everyone because of the Cambridge Science Festival, which is held each year during this time. We enter the Mineral and Rock Hall and view some spectacular specimens organized by rock type, mineral type, chemistry, and other attributes. The specimens are organized both to show the physical beauty and to educate. We first look at the large mineral specimens that line the outside wall of the exhibit. The colors and crystal structures are spectacular. Along one wall is a very informative timeline that describes Earth history over 4.5 billion years with actual fossil, mineral, and rock samples in concise narrative.
And of course, no mineral and rock display would be complete without a description of plate tectonics, including some of the life forms and processes that occur at plate boundaries. The inner cabinets contained rock and mineral examples grouped by mineral type, locality of collection, and other attributes. There is also a great display on meteors. Or is it meteorite? Or maybe meteoroid? From the mineral and rock display, we, vi we visit the famous Weir collection of glass flowers and plants. These exquisite glass models were made as a teaching aid and botany exhibit by the father and son artists Leopold and Rudolf Blaschka between 1887 and 1936. Among the display are pictures of the family and one of their workbenches. There are 847 life-size models representing 780 species. There are over 3,000 models of enlarged flower and plant parts. The Blaschkas also created models of some sea creatures, such as jellyfish, sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and mollusks. From here, I go to a display on climate change. The display provides data on climate trends throughout Earth history and how science collects and organizes climate data. There are displays on the forces that influence climate and the impact on life as climate changes. On display are Argo devices that are used to measure ocean attributes such as temperature, salinity, pressure, and ocean currents in the upper 6,500 feet of the oceans. There are over 4,000 Argo devices deployed in the oceans of the world. Argo is one of the many multinational scientific collaborations to study climate change. I am starting to suffer from brain overload, but I still need to go to several more displays. My next stop is the display on fossils in the Roma Hall of Vertebrae Paleontology. The Roma Hall showcases the evolutionary history of verte vertebrae paleontology. The concepts are based on the recognized and accepted science of evolutionary theory. Adaptation, isolation, transitional species, mutations are some, some of the concepts described and shown using research from evolutionary theory and with examples from the fossil record. There are many displays. Some of the highlights include the 42-foot Coronosaurus skeleton. The eight-foot, six-million-year-old fossil turtle shell. There are many displays of Permian fossils. There are numerous dinosaur fossils, including a Triceratops head, Platyosaurus, collections of fossil, fossil fish, trilobites, insects in amber, and early amphibians. Displays of flying reptiles, the pterosaurs, which were among the first vertebrates to take to the air, are many. The pteranodon had a 14-foot wingspan. Several transitional fossils are shown, including the Ar Archaeopteryx, which is the dinosaur to bird transition, is displayed as a cast, and the transitional fossil Tiktaalik, showing the transition that animals made from water to land. Of special note is an interesting display of Cenozoic fossils, including a mastodon and a comparison of a mastodon and mammoth tooth to show adaptations to different environments. There is a great display of horse evolution showing the adaptation to different environments of equine species through fossil specimens. Of note is the evolution of the foot, which shows the changes from toes to hoofs as environmental pressures and adaptations fuel change. 
We also see changes in the teeth and jaw as the horse adapts to changing environments. There are several examples of evolutionary dead ends and also examples of some of the bizarre species that evolved as a result of the geographic isolation of South America. I always have to check out the hominin fossils to see our closest ancestors. Onward to the Hall of Mammals, which displays animals from all corners of the world, complete with several complete whale skeletons, which you can view from below or at eye level. There are elephants, giraffes, tigers, lions, hippos, rhinos, and the list just goes on. If you can think of a species, it can be found in the Hall of Mammals. Beautifully arranged exhibits. On the way out, we pass extensive collections of butterflies, moths, beetles, bugs, arthropods, bats, and other creepy crawly things. Of note was the 150,000 specimen beetle collection donated from David Rockefeller. We leave the museum after two and a half hours with our senses elevated and heads full. We didn't go to the museums of archaeology and ethnology or the Museum of Vintage Scientific Equipment. We will leave that for another day. We head back through Harvard Yard towards Harvard Square. It is only 12 o'clock and I can see Carol debating our next move. Do we go back to Littleton or do we do some more exploring in town. The decision will be in part two of April in Cambridge and Boston.